All right, everyone. This is uh, Chad again. There's Trey Pierce returning from our previous video. Uh, obviously, he types as ENTJ. So, Trey, if you just want to give a brief background, uh, introduce your channel. That'd be awesome. Yeah, uh, I'm an ENTJ. I make videos about being an ENTJ, interactions that I can see between people, interactions between me and specific types. Uh, you know, I had temporary time in Italy, and uh, you know, I guess that kind of helped me like learn more about people who I couldn't understand because of the language barrier. And uh, yeah, I'm here making videos with Chad, Andrew, and Max. Perfect. And then uh, okay. obviously Max, uh, he's right there hiding in the library. Um, and he's a, he types as <laughs> an ENTP. He's made a few videos on YouTube previously. He's been a YouTube advocate, great commentary. Uh, again, he types as ENTP. Max, if you just want to tell a brief uh, bio about yourself, that'd be awesome. I'm Max, so there's nothing to tell about me. Go away, guys. Please. <laughs> All right, so he's hiding in the library. And then there's Andrew, types as an ESTP. Um, he's uh, over there in the far corner of Nashville. Is that right? Close to Nashville, Murfreesboro. Okay, so he's out there in uh, Murfreesboro. And uh, Andrew, if you just want to give a brief, brief background and kind of what got you in MBTI, that'd be awesome. Sure. So, <clears throat> unlike the others, I'm more about Chad's age. <laughs> I got into MBTI back when I was about 19 years old. So I was wondering a long time ago about why people were taking me the way they were taking me. Like, they were having negative reactions to things I would say, and I didn't really get why, because I didn't think that there was anything particularly offensive in my encode. And I wound up getting Kiersey's book and kind of blossomed from there. And also, I mean, I went through MBTI Step 2 with Chad. So luckily we have a pretty solidly confirmed ESTP type on me now. Perfect. So basically what we're missing is in this group is an, a person who preferences introversion and a perf person who preferences feeling. That would balance out the two uh, overwhelming extroversion amount we have going on here and the amount of logic being, going to be thrown around in this conversation. So it's going to get really exciting here in a second, I'd imagine at least. Trey's already thinking of something. That's a good point. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, before... I actually went live. We were just talking about different, um, what was it, different thinking patterns with different extroversion versus introversion, kind of what they, like the behavioralist school and then the, the, the way that we do it in MBTI. Um, is that where you guys were, right? Just about, yeah. Okay. And uh, so I guess what they started out with was people who prefer extroversion, obviously, um, when I notice the key words that I use is preference. You prefer it because we, there's times where we're going to introvert, there's times where we're going to extrovert. So people who prefer extroversion typically focus their energy on the outer world, and uh, they focus on direct energy outward, and they receive energy from the outer world. So that is extroversion. And it could be task-oriented, it could be people-oriented, it could be idea-oriented, but it's generally external. Basically, I was talking about, I was talking about um, how... Extroverted, extroverted people, like, oftentimes other other groups in social dynamics would type someone as an um, introvert just because they're being alone, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're an introvert because um, extroverts tend to, they, they want to, they want, they have desires, they have social desires, and they have desires to uh, be with people, be with other people while I'm just explaining the difference between extrovert and introvert. Um, if, um, and introvert, in, introverts, um, they they tend to think that um, they're all, they're constantly around other people and they want to be solitary, even though they they might appear ex extroverted. So so like just because like someone else is like extremely sociable doesn't mean that they're extroverted. They they might be extremely social, but they might have desires to be alone, more desires to be alone, and um, that's basically the difference between extrovert and introvert. Um, it's just the way the brain, the, the difference between how the brain um, chemistry, 
chemistry worse. Morally. Yeah. Okay, so I think Trey just, has, like, Trey has something to different, add to different approaches. Okay, yeah, yes. I could say something. So, yeah, um, typically uh, extroverts will... It's more, it's more about receiving energy, you know what I mean? Like, for me, like, I, I, I've known some INFPs who, uh, who, like, have this desire to have friends, and that's because they haven't been able to find anybody that could get really close to them. And so for that... They, they felt like they needed to like make lots of friends and so I, I've, I've like you know I've recommended like hey you know like you can do what you want but like you know I feel like for you it would be better to stay out of the drama and like find a few people that you could associate with and be great friends with because INFPs typically get really um, really engaged with all that drama when they make lots of friends and so you know for for me um, I would say that uh, sometimes introverts have a need um, to to be extroverted, more extroverted, um, like you know, talk to people, have more friends, and so for me, uh, I'd say that yeah, and they get I think they get pretty drained out. Really, although, although like both extroverts and introverts get drained from conversation, introverts yeah. tend to like have more inward. Well, that that's where yeah, they're focusing yeah. their attention. Their attention is being focused yeah, yeah. inward. So typically, you, they will get drained. Really depends on like, forced to fo focus outward. But let's keep in mind that um, that you have your dominant and secondary function, and those are the two that you use the most often, and you know, in the beginning of your life. So just consider that both of those are going to, you know, take place. But it's just that you prefer the more dominant one, which would be whatever your type is, extroverted or introverted. And so, you know, um, and that majorly determines whether you're extroverted or introverted in the sense of the behavioralist school. Yeah. So, anything to add, Andrew? Yeah, I just I mean, the reason that I got with Chad at all was actually because I heard the original cognitive idea behind extroversion and introversion from Jung, which stated extroversion, when presented with an object, locks onto the object. Introversion locks onto uh, perceptions inside the mind based on the object but is not truly locking onto the object. At that point, I couldn't tell which way I was going. And that's why I got to the point of I need to get typed by an outsider. And then the behavioral part of it follows after that. But of course, since it's really based on preference, not an absolute way you have to act, I mean, the facets can be out of preference, and there were two out of the five that are measured on the step two MBTI were out of preference for me, even though I am pretty clearly an extrovert. Yeah, to, and that sounds about right. So there's some there's some functions that are operating in introversion as he's operating in extroversion in his dominant function, which pull those facets into the other direction out of preference from a cognitive standpoint. But that's classic Jung at the same time. You get, you get this really complex focusing on an object, and it's hard to perceive that about yourself, hence why Myers and Briggs created MBTI after Jung's ideas, but it wasn't... Jung made, had a model which wasn't really ap applicable to people in a, in a wide-scale range, unless you were, like, tested over and over and over and over again. And so that's where Myers and Briggs came in in the first place. Hmm. They made it way more user-friendly. Exactly, and it, it becomes very user-friendly with that regard. So w with that, with people saying they're extroverted or introverted, we're really both, but we have a preference. For me, like, it's definitely extroversion. It's very task-oriented. Um, it's very focused on moving and action. If I find myself sitting, I get antsy. I gotta go. I gotta do something. I can't just sit and reflect. That's just miserable to me. <laughs> I don't. It's like okay, let's let's go do something. So even right now, I'm standing here and I've, I've got to move. Like, <laughs> and that's just. Oh no, we're about Trey. Like, do what? Like, yeah, what? introduce yourself. Yeah, you know, like I don't know. Like I want to know. Like I don't know. Like. There are like two ETJs here, and like I want them to introduce themselves more. All right. Um, okay. Well, here I have an idea. I have an idea how we can uh, plug this in. So, one thing I was thinking about when um, when Andrew was talking was that 
you you were talking about you know not really knowing what you were and it, yeah at the beginning and and it reminded me of a before I had taken Myers Briggs you know personally I was no good with um, being like social you know I was I didn't have a lot of friends um, maybe like two or three and the, the problem was I didn't recognize my strengths and and what I would do is I knew what people were were thinking about everything like I was pretty good with that like understanding like what they were feeling about the situation and stuff like that regular social skills and um, and I recognized that I had them but it wasn't like I didn't really think about utilizing because the thing is I, I saw it as a big game everyone was playing and I actually got annoyed I was like this is ridiculous like you're doing the same thing the last person did like the last five or six times and so what Myers-Briggs really helped me do is put into perspective what my skills can do because I didn't really see them as skills I saw them as something I had noticed that was annoying and so um, and so for me you know Myers-Briggs helped me recognize that you know those things that I had um, I had insight to would help me um, attain other things or, or help me in life I didn't really recognize that so absolutely and it's a I, bit I would of an introduction to, I would have to concur with that I, I definitely relate to what he just said the same thing is like you notice these patterns and you're looking at this big game and you realize that you're, you're people are trying to play this, this these dynamics and you're just like I'm not playing this stupid game yeah. like I know what you're doing like I know exactly what you're doing and I'm not playing it there's no way so I, I can recall um, being able to see this game at 10 11 12 years old yeah and, same. yeah and it just ever since it's just been like I always break the rules because of it. It's like, okay, I'm not going to play this game. I'm going to go against it. I'm going to go against it. And, you know, I'm going to make my own system. I'm going to do it my way. Yeah. So, because you see it early on. It, and that's the that's the common misconception about ENTJs is because we don't necessarily choose to be social. We tend to want to prefer task orientation even to people, like getting things done. So it's often time that someone, an ENTJ will choose work over play or work over hanging out or work over other things because they've got things to do that they see as moving forward or driving forward. Oh yeah, definitely. And you know, um, another thing is when, when I was in that state, you know, I had recognized that it took me, I think it was eighth grade that I really recognized that I knew things that other people didn't because I, I think it was like boiling up inside me and I was annoyed. I was highly annoyed and I just came out and I was like, like, why are you asking that question? Like, you already know the answer. And they're like, what are you talking about? I don't know the answer. And they're like, they're like, what do you think the answer is? And I said it and it was right. And so in that moment, everyone like recognized that I had this and I recognized that I had it. And I was amazed. And so, you know, I didn't really recognize that I knew more than everyone else. I thought everyone, you know, knew as much as me. And, you know, I thought they were all playing the game on purpose. And I didn't like it. So something that, you know, Myers Briggs just helps direct. Well, I would definitely agree with that angle too because it's it's I can relate to that totally. The biggest thing that was a challenge in my youth was not using my intuition was a big challenge in my younger years because you what? Have, it, it was a challenge, and I, I wanted to not use it because... Oh, not being able to use your question. I, no, 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 not use it. I was using it, and it, it predicted so well. Yeah, and I mean, like, I mean, I mean like... And yeah, 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 I mean, like, you didn't have the opportunity to use your intuition. Well, no, I was always using it. That was the problem. And because of that, I got really, really... I had great foresight. I could calculate what was going to happen way before it happened. And so when it came to socializing with people, I'd be like, let me tell you what you're going to say, and here's what you're going to do. And they're like, yeah. you, don't, you don't know me. You don't know, you don't know what I'm going to do. I'm like, I know exactly why you're doing what you're doing. And here's what you're going to try to do, and here's what you're trying to accomplish. That is so they, weird because... And they get they Because get extrovert is too... I work like this... <laughs> I work... Um, it's so weird because it's similar. Like I, I'm kind of intuitive about people, but it's like I... Um, I guess I... It's it's like the same it's like the same thing you know like um, I I understand I understand people the same way like how how they're gonna like oh uh, like how like in in general I'm like I know what they're gonna say like what they're gonna act this like for you for but it's like 
and I and interpreting intuition is and external intuition is kind of like two sides of the same coin. It's like I don't know. It's I mean I know. <laughs> yeah, one one is convergent and it's one like, is divergent. So one is coming up with a, mi a many many different possibilities of what could happen. The other one is calculating and confining to one conclusion. But they're both predicting. Yeah, yeah. it's like it's like when I hear an intuitive like actually like like predict something or like calculate something and they they tell me like what they think. It's like so similar to me to what like it's so similar to like what I can do, but it's like how I how I figure it how how I figure out that conclusion is so much is, is such a different I have such a different approach to figure out figuring out things. It's like it's the difference between interior thinking, extra intuition versus interior intuition it extra thinking. It's like yeah. But let's ask yeah. Andrew real quick from his angle. Like he uh, he obviously intuition is his last function. So I kind of want to hear his perspective of what's what goes on in his head during these these this just exchange of intuitive information about how we saw the world when we were younger. Well, in my case, <laughs> intuition did not happen very much, and even now psychologically, it's the five year old part of my psyche. So in my case. I did not see this big game happening. I saw mostly, like, when I first got to college, freshman year, all these people seemed to, like, make friends and instantly form clicks. And I saw it all happening, but then I was like, what just happened? I don't even know. And, I yeah, I completely miss it. It's like I could tell something was happening but I had no idea what it was because I wasn't looking at that level. <laughs> and the other thing, in the way you all notice the way people are talking that you've all pretty much covered, I listen very carefully for how people are connecting ideas together. I'm not listening that closely to the idea itself. Once I see that the ideas are properly linked, then I'll really catch on. Okay. And so you need that kind of sequential build-up to that conceptual idea, then. Is that I can correct? definitely see that in sensors, you know. Yeah. I've had a hard time explaining anything to sensors because I'm just, I'm just like trying to tell them about something that doesn't even seem to exist, I guess, to them, and that. it's like. I need to like really plan how I'm going to explain it to them beforehand and be like, all right, so you know, I'm going to talk about how this relates to this like planet Earth, you know, really connect the two. I can see that definitely. Yeah. So what what is extroverted sensing like being as your dominant function? Can you tell me what? I didn't hear you. Tell me what goes through your mind, Andrew, as a dominant extroverted sensor. Kind of like, how do you see the world? Like, what's your normal way of perceiving information and well, taking it in? If if someone asks me how I'm doing, the, my natural inclination is to just talk about the physical environment around me, or maybe talk about health issues or something. So so you uh, go into detail about things. Is that is that what the reference was? Yeah, I'll just. But how do you know that you're an SC user, not an SI user? Because introvert sensing and extrovert sensing is. Pretty similar, but what makes you think that you're an, you're an extrovert sensor, not an introvert sensor? Well, because I clearly typed that way, and also introverted sensing, while it has a very good memory, it has a memory for understanding sensory information, whereas my auxiliary is introverted thinking, which fits me way better. And introverted thinking gravitates towards facts and bits of logic or reasoning. So when I'm recalling things, it's definitely coming from a place of introverted thinking. I'm not remembering sensory information. I'm remembering factual information. Good answer. Right on. Thanks. Trey, you got another thought. I can tell. <laughs> no, I was just Go thinking about the way that you like. It was a good explanation. So, 
That's what yeah. I was thinking about. Yeah, that was a that was a really awesome answer. Like, I, it, it's not often that we get to talk and interact with because Myers Briggs is really an NF. I think NFs tend to be the people that draw toward Myers Briggs more than any other personality type, mainly because Myers Briggs is people oriented, and then uh, not to mention that it's also an intuitive theory. So it's not often that we get to interact with people who have a preference for sensing on forums like this. So hearing that perspective actually broadens my horizon quite a bit. Thanks. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so um, that was really interesting how you said that, you know, you, you don't recall information by sensory experiences, but you recall it by logic. That's, that's very fascinating because I realize that I recall information through patterns. I don't, I don't recall sensory information, rarely. I can't even remember what the food I just ate tastes like. So I don't remember any of that. And what I do remember is, like, the pattern of things, how things flow, the, the big pattern and meaning behind things. And that's what I recall when I think of, uh, when I go into re trying to recall something. I'm like, okay, this is what they did. This is what I, this is what's going to happen. Here's the pattern. There's where its trajectory is heading. That's what's going to happen in the future. So... That's interesting how you put it that way because it really makes me think about how I actually recall information as well because, I mean, ultimately, the two introverted function I use is feeling and intuition, and those are the primary preferences that I use. And looking back at that, I'm like, oh, wow, that is true. I, could, I, I go in and I recall the value-based things or I recall those patterns. I can make a video yeah. like all about introverted intuition. Like it's, it's like, you, like I'm so interested in, in it because... It's, it's so similar to the extra intuition, but it's like it's so it's completely different. It works completely differently. Like it arrives at the same conclusions. Usually, they arrive at the similar conclusions. Always like have the same viewpoints. Always have like the same base. <clears throat> like like they they sound like very similar, but it works completely differently. And yeah, so. The one thing that I really want to I really want to capture in this, and we can go into intuition, but I, what I really want to capture is two extroverted feeling and introverted thinking uh, in your middle stack. Both the ENTP and ESTP both have these two functions in their middle stack. How do you guys use that extroverted feeling in your daily life? I'm not sure I do. That's actually why I want to meet your other friend who can charm the ladies. Oh yeah, yeah. I'll definitely get try to get him on one of these calls. <laughs> yeah. He's uh he definitely uses that extroverted feeling to his his what maximum he, what, ability. What is he? ESTP. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he's a he's a very smooth talker. He's really polished, and he he knows how to use that extroverted feeling like nobody I've ever seen before. He's really good at it. So all for his. I want to see more in like social situations. Yeah. So how do you use it, Max? Like how do you use FE? Um. Effie is like, uh, like last time when you made a video about like how you like remember like, um, when you made the group talk with Trey, and you talked about like how, um, you, you like, you know like, you 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 come up you use your tea to come up with many like different. Things to say, and like you, um, you, 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 I guess you like logically like predict whether what you're gonna say, how is it gonna affect, how will, I mean, like, what's it gonna do? Well, um, what's the effect of saying something? And, um, for me, it's like, I guess, I guess I'm, I'm really good at knowing, you know, what? okay. T users, T users are really bad at knowing how other people feel. Uh, well, from my experience, and F E users basically know exactly what what needs to be said because they basically know, since they know like how other people, like basically they understand, since they understand other people objectively, um, they know exactly what needs to be said like naturally, and and I guess. I guess T users user user T to understand what needs to be said and like they don't know how it's gonna affect but they I guess they're, they're seeing they're looking for the results and what they're gonna say while F users are looking for um, I guess communication uh, some 
some com communication results or like like a result in a friendship. So uh, to to encapsulate this, what I'm what I'm hearing from you is just like we said earlier, which was where your where your focus is when you're using FI or you're using uh, TE. Um, when you're using FI, your feelings, your your focus of attention is directed inward, so you're not really focused on people's feelings around you. So typically, you can not be aware of people's emotions or feelings around you because you're not focused on it. Versus an FE user who's aware of those feelings because their feelings are focused externally. It's extroversion. They're focused on the feelings around because, them. Because we objectively understand people. Right. And we just so, understand like, people in general. Okay, Trey? Yeah, okay, I have an idea, right? So uh, this whole time, you know, when I heard you saying this, it, it made sense, but I have something to add personally, right? So this is why they say they're, like, each person is an exception to the rule because personally... I don't understand people, but you wouldn't be able to tell, like unless like we got on a really deep level, because I I do understand like the way I need to say things in order to like to get you to trust me and stuff like that. Like I, I understand that, and for for me, I've studied so much about like people. It's been like one of my favorite theories. Like I'm trying to find more stuff because Myers Briggs is like the one thing that I've spent the most time on. And you know, it's like it's like, you know, before Myers Briggs I even was really interested in the way that people worked and you know, I tried looking up like, you know, how to spot liars, stuff like that, but everything that they said seemed so basic That's to me. And and I you know, for me it's been one of my favorite, you know, theories and ideas. So for me, like, you know, when people when people tell me something that's personal or something like that, like I, I give them this nod that looks like I care and stuff like that. And I know that I have to do those things. It's all objective. And, and you know, I'm really, I think that, you know, I'm really focused on, you know, making them feel like they can trust me. And so for me, I try to establish a relationship on a deep level. And I've been, you know, watching it for so long, I, I'm really good at faking it. And so for me, you know... Um, that's, that's actually really interesting how you, like... How you need to like actually like gather data about people to actually understand them. For me, it's like I kind of since I know how the other people react and like I kind of study it and I just gather that information and then I make like objective like research, I guess, on other on how on what people are gonna say, like what they're gonna do and things like that and. It's just interesting, like how you guys, how you, how to users have to have actually like, like read book, books about <laughs> people to understand them, like for example, or like actually like look up a certain topic and like <laughs> go and, well, here's and the thing. like. Here's the thing. You know, I did, I did try to research, but my problem was when I did research, everything that everyone else was talking about online and all the videos I could find were so basic that I didn't feel like anyone else could offer me any good information. So <laughs> we'll see, so, the issue that I had with it... I, I still was, have weak, weak extra feelings, so I still have... A, I don't... I'm not as good as, as, things, uh, as things do not matter as, in, as like, a dominant F user. <laughs> and well, even, you know, uh, really quick, Chad, I want to yeah. I want to finish my thought really quick. Go ahead. Um, but you also have to recognize I told you I, I didn't have very many friends at the for the first like up to eighth grade, right? So for that point in time, I was really watching everyone, and it was more I was observing people <laughs> with my introverted intuition, and so I learned quite a bit from that. And so because I learned so much, I was looking for more information and still not finding anything, and it really did frustrate me. But I did, I did, you know, get patterns, you know, with people. So go ahead, Chad. Yeah, so you mentioned that you had to look up information. One of the things that I did was, because, Trey, I'm, like, on the same boat as you. For me, it was like I took all this, this information about studying people, but I had to line it up in sequence, like, step one, say this. Step two, say this. Step three, say this. Step four. And I went through this list, and, and you know, and it worked, but it wasn't real. And so that's where I started having a clash, and I said, you know what? <laughs> this, whole, this, whole, this whole step system isn't working because it's not who I am. I don't feel like I need to be saying these things. So instead of trying to make all these friends by saying what people recommend that I say, I started learning just to be myself. 
and that was the answer for me was just to, to just to be me and stop trying these step systems and learning. That's so but, funny. But learning about people, absolutely, and learning how to better influence people. I have at least twenty to thirty books about influencing people on my shelf right here that I've studied and read over and over and over again. And it's because I just see it as as something that needs to be studied. But whereas somebody who has FE, they're probably thinking, why do you need to study? It kind of comes naturally to me. And whereas for us, it doesn't. It doesn't come naturally. It's it's I, like like I I actually I understand your perspective. Like a teaser. I like I, I guys I I understand you guys you guys it's funny to see this because according to, like if you study socionics I follow socionics but I have strong unvalued T so basically it's it's like my shadow function and I have strong unvalued T so if when I hear a T user it's, it's familiar like I understand it but like. I am, but it's like I understand that perspective. Andrew, let's uh, let's hear a little bit more of your perspective on what's going on here. What exactly was this perspective? Let's hear your perspective. Yeah, well, how exactly are we targeting this subject again? Oh, we're just going after. Uh, I'm sorry, I should have made it more clear. Clear, clear. And what I'm what we're looking for is we're talking about FE, and you say you said you're not sure if you're you, you're even using it. <laughs> yeah. You know, and uh, that's, I don't know if you have ever been in a situation where you felt like you've accommodated people or you just knew how people felt. Um, here's an example. Like, when I'm in a situation, I only know how people feel by reflecting on how I would feel. Like, I'm like, that's how I would feel, so that's probably how he feels. Yeah, definitely. Instead of going, how does he feel? Like, I don't know. And I have no clue. Like, I just reflect and go... <laughs> I would feel this way if somebody did this, so I, I'm just, I'm assuming they would feel that way too, and so that's that's uh that's that introverted feeling. Whereas you're an FE user, how is that experience for you? Like knowing how somebody feels, what is it like? Well, I mean, it, see, it depends on like how far I have to go down the function stack to really reach a point of sympathy or empathy. Yeah. Obviously, there are things that happen to someone. And we have instant sympathy or empathy for it. You know, someone gets diagnosed with cancer. Someone close to someone dies. You do? Well, that's, well, not, I'm that's how you, <laughs> you use it. It's like, it's like you know, I mean, Chad, do you? Case, you know, to just offer your sympathy. Yeah, honestly, do you? <laughs> what? Do I what? Do you have empathy? No. Like, it doesn't see, because when I hear that kind of news, like I mean, I'm like, I'm both I'm like, oh, I feel like and extrovert feelers have empathy, but it's a different. It's a different like they have a different approach to it. Like it doesn't necessarily like mean that T users don't have empathy. They have different types. It's a different version of empathy. It's, it's the difference lies in extrovert feeling between FE and FI. Well, my my thing is like when I hear that kind of news, like, um, I, I, I just I don't know. I guess I talk to them differently. I, I oh yeah, because I don't. I mean, I I don't want to come off as anything. So I I don't. I talk to them differently, but I I don't really understand. Like, <laughs> this is hard to say, but. I think you guys get what I'm saying. Really, I don't. I don't empathize on the same level that I think a lot of people do. Yeah, <laughs> I would agree with you. See, I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be blunt here and say that truthfully, I don't care much. Yeah. Um, I. Yeah. I mean, it's it's terrible, but I'm. It's. I don't care the much. Point of research. Yeah, and and the reason why I say this is because I the way that I I process information is that I see the world in this huge pattern, this big underlying meeting, and and so my brain. I feel for their situation in the sense that I, I'm sorry that they have to be to go through that. But as far as like uh, the impact of what it has on the rest of the world, it's not to me. It's not as a. It's not a major crisis. It's not oh, like it's similar to me. It's I think what? it's an intuitive thing. Like yes, I think it's and, an intuitive thing. Well, no, 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 an NFT thing, not not for ENFPs, but like ENFPs and ENTJs tend to have like more a logical objective analysis on how people work and like how side things 
and it's like when you, when I see like some some article like about someone dying, like I, just don't, I don't care. Like it doesn't have it has no relevance to my life at all. So it's like I don't really understand why I need to see something like that because it has no relevance to me. So I think it's just an empty thing. And empties are really similar to each other. Yeah, we're. I guess we're pretty bad when it comes to that because it, society expects us to be one way. It's like you, you, even saying that I don't care, I can see the flack that I may get for somebody to say, "Oh, you should." Yeah, care. exactly. But I still don't even care what society says. <laughs> like, so well, ultimate. Okay, you know, I do. Like, that's that's. I don't think I should like follow expectations for society. I mean, society like <laughs> they could be as they could be as insane as possible. Why should I? Like, there's no, if there, if you have like a lot for all intuitives out there, if you have like a logical rash, rationale for what needs to be what's right, and you know that it's that it's something that is actually useful, and then why should you follow society standards? I mean, it doesn't make any sense to do it. Um, I was gonna interrupt really quick. I feel as if. Uh we may have bothered Andrew because we haven't gone back to his extroverted feeling and that was the main focus I think was to understand more about that so Andrew you want to explain yourself on that? Yeah <laughs> so I would say um, let me relate it to a real situation back when I was a junior in high school one of my brother's close friends uh, his father was killed in a car crash Okay. and now, I was not emotionally distraught by his father dying. I mean, I didn't know him well, and we, you know, shared the same faith. I'm, I'm sure he went to the right place. But if uh, if my brother's friend was going to come over, I would want to emanate an aura of empathy. Like, that's when I would probably walk on eggshells is when he was, like, right in front of me. And I wouldn't say anything untoward. I wouldn't be critical. I wouldn't be acting like myself in a lot of cases. But also, um, of course, since it's my tertiary function, I would be expending a ton of mental energy doing all of it, too. Whereas your your ESFJ, which my mom is, would have that come very naturally to her. Yeah. It seems like everybody's mom's an ESFJ. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, just making an observation there. But, um, but on, I think on, my mom's an ENFP. So uh, just a quick reminder, we do get a comment on the channel. It's from Ragad Al Agla. And they're asking if we they we read the comments, and I am getting the comments. So if you post a question, it's very likely that I'll be able to answer that. But in the meantime, we'll continue this conversation. So if there is a comment, I'll try to respond to that as quickly as possible. However, I'll I'll let the the, the guests that we have speak, obviously. But um, it's interesting, Andrew, that you mentioned that uh, you know you're expending amount th this energy because I also will take care of people, but I don't do it in the sense of words. I don't say, oh, I'm so sorry, oh, I'm this. I'm just like, hey, let's go do this. Let's do this. Do you want to talk? How do you want to, like, I'm still using TE to try to address the problem, or I even use SE, like, let's let's go have a good, you know, drink of this, or let's do this, or, and I, I will find ways to do that, but using FE and trying to accommodate them through words, it, it doesn't work for me. It, it just feels so unnatural, and it's just, to me, it's just oddballing. It's I don't even know what to say to comfort somebody in that regard. So I'm just a person that has to do it with action. It's like, I'll take hey, care John, of you. Are you talking you about ESFJs right now? No. I'm talking about me, which is me. Okay. <laughs> um, I have some input on that as well. There's so you said that you would put on an aura of, yeah. um, of like, would you, what word did you use again? Of empathy. Yeah. So for for when I hear that, I don't put on an aura of empathy. Um, when they come in, and if it were like a situation like you said where it was your brother's friend, yeah. um, I might talk to them, but if I, if I, if a lot of people are talking about it, I'll leave. 
because um, personally I see it as something that's being taken care of and something that I don't really have a lot of input on and I don't feel like I would bring anything to the table. And that's that's even before I ever, you know, knew about Myers-Briggs. I just, I didn't, you know, I, all I could do was like sit there and gasp. Like, oh my gosh, that happened? Like, you know, it wasn't really a... Um, anything I could really help. And if they were someone that I knew, you know, I'd ask them if they would want to talk and, you know, I'd be there for them. And if it was someone that I knew, maybe offer, you know, to hang out, like stuff like that. But I would tell them, I would make sure they know I'm not doing it just because of that, but because I can be there for them if they need me. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, instead of just like, oh, now that, you know, something tragic happened, you know, I'll hang out with you. Which that would make me mad. So, <laughs> um, one thing I was interested in asking Chad, actually, um, because because we're talking about feelings, is how he uses his introverted feelings. Just because, um, you know, my I've had some interesting experiences, and so I've just kind of wondered how Chad's uh, feelings were. Okay, so can you specify the question so I can answer it and don't go on a tangent? <laughs> yeah, um, okay, so I basically want you to just be straight up and not necessarily talk about um, Myers-Briggs in a sense, but just how, you've, uh, how you recognize your feelings and not necessarily making decisions, but just when you're feeling, when you're in that mode, which you know I've heard that ENTJs tend to have emotional streaks and that does apply to me. You know, every like like once a month or like once every two or three months. You know, it, it really depends. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. uh, it's it's more than that. So it's just, it's not too common, but that whole day, I don't really know what I'm feeling. And for me, you know, um, I'll spend the whole day just not necessarily thinking about too much. You know what I mean? I'm not necessarily strategizing or anything like that like I might normally be doing. And, you know, I, I try to distract myself. It doesn't really work very well. But it's just a whole day of being um, sort of absent in a sense. And um, I wanted to know, you know, even when you're private and when you're no longer with, you know, people, how – and when you are with people and you're feeling that if you feel that, um, I just really want to know how it acts for you and how it feels and maybe even, um, you know – if it's ever manifested itself in, in certain ways. Okay, so, yeah, to answer that question, for me, it, it, it definitely, I also have these sentimental streaks. Um, they're probably once a month, twice every year. I mean, they're rare, but they do come up, and when they do come up, uh, the best way that I find to handle them is just to reflect on them and appreciate them when they arrive. And I tend to have to want to, I want to extrovert them naturally. But I don't want to extrovert them to people. I just got to get it out. And so, um, yeah. and so I usually resort to writing or doing artwork or doing some kind of craft that allows me to express myself because I don't feel like my words. I also do right. Do what? I also uh, resort to like writing and like doing our work at art and do actually like John when I have like uh, some particular feeling that I need to just need to get out. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I want to extrovert them in some way. So <laughs> when it comes to me, it's like I have to, I don't feel like words can capture the way I feel because it's so complex. And I simply just don't have the vocabulary to capture it. So uh, I, try, I try to write, and I just don't feel like I can capture what I'm actually feeling. So I found that artwork or something. Uh, something that's expressive can capture more of what you're feeling than even uh, just the the writing of it. So, for example, uh, practicing like even like tai chi or martial arts or something, it's a it's a way of self-expression. And to me, that is a is a way that I feel like I can actually express the way I feel at any given moment. Or you know, even trying to talk about it, but. It doesn't feel like I can ever get to the root of it if I'm just trying to talk about it. It feels like I'm missing something. And so yeah. uh, the way that I handle my feelings is when they do come up is I don't know, I'm don't i unaware of them most of the time anyway. I don't, I don't consciously I don't consciously uh, I don't consciously know what I'm feeling at any given time. 
I really have to think about it. Like, if you said something highly offensive, I wouldn't know about it until like three days later. Like, it would really take me, like you say, how do you feel about that? I'm like, I'm not sure. I can tell you what I think. Or you ask me, how do you feel about somebody? I won't really know what to tell you. I can just give you the pros and cons. I don't know, like, specifically how I feel about a particular person, but my actions tend to manifest as I do care about people, so my actions will manifest those. But as of being aware or being able to define my feelings, it's very unconscious for me. So Okay. Yeah, uh, I've actually used very long metaphors to explain my feelings, uh, and, and I've painted pictures for people and like with my words. Um, you know, I've written That's some things to um, – I've written things to, you know, describe what I'm thinking, the kind of thoughts that I'm having, um, and – and I think I do pretty well. I think that my in intuition might kick in, and that's probably why I do well with uh, with describing them. But you know, I write, and you know, if you had me on Instagram, you would see those writings. Um, I write quite a bit, and I do put it that out. That's so interesting. Like, you you wouldn't typically hear a T user like actually expressing their feelings like in, through uh, through their FI. Like you know. You stereotypically like a normal workplace or somewhere else. To users would express their feelings through like being over, let's say unhealthily, like through like over dominance, controlling, yelling, and like it's very interesting to hear how to users express their feelings through their FI, like actually drawing, like another or like creativity. It's just interesting because it doesn't come, it come, doesn't come really. It's, it's not. It's like unheard of. Well, it's not. I, I've never heard of it. I mean, my mom is in East J, so she's. I'm. I'm I've never actually witnessed that. Yeah. Well, you know, um, what's interesting is, you know, for Chad and me, there's a difference. I've actually talked to Chad. Um, he's told me about his writings before, and um, you know, it's interesting because I put mine on Instagram. I put them out there, but Chad does not. He said that if anyone were to stumble across them, he wouldn't care, you know. But I think this is the difference between Enneagram as well, because me, I'm trying to give that image of, like, I do have these feelings. Like, they are there. And I think that communicating them and writing them has really helped me to have a better image as a person so people can understand that I'm not just some jerk, you know what I mean, that, or, or something like that. Because I, I've been relatively good with um, understanding people, and so... Um, you know, I don't think I come across that way, but it's just given me another level of, um, like, trust because I may look objective all the time. You know what I mean? So when they can see that I actually do, um, it's like a le another level of validity that they, that I actually am feeling that I'm not like faking it or something, which I fake really well. So, um, but you know, talking about all that, I have had times where I've tried to get into uh, like into my feelings, like tried consciously to work on them, and when I have, um, you know, the moment I get in, I want out, <laughs> you know, because I'm just like, this is terrible. It feels weird. I don't. I, I really can't explain it to you. It's just the weirdest feeling. It's just, um, I just have this whole other. Um, it, it just feels like I'm not going anywhere. It feels like I'm. I'm. If if I may add so to that too, because it, it feels like a bottomless pit. <laughs> The, the the emotions are so complex to me that when you're in, when you're exploring them, it feels like they're so deep and they're so like you almost feel like there's no rival to that. And it feels like so at the same time, at the same time, it feels like who I might actually really be. And I'm I'm moving toward life, moving toward figuring that out. But at the very core, I feel like that is who I really I'll am. Save the problems. Yeah, I feel like that is who like, I really am at the bottom. Of my, of my deepest level, but you know, it's I've got all these other aspects in this shell and this type of thing. But that very core bottom emotion is—it's like I don't—I don't know, and it's confusing and it's scary in a way. It's like, oh yeah, how do you how do you deal with this? Like, how do you people who actually have feelings? <laughs> how I think, do you actually I think the, deal with this? I think it's essential to have a positive approach towards your feelings. Like, if you have a negative relate, well, as they say, relationship. With your feelings is very is very toxic to for yourself, and I think 
people in general should have a pot like should actually express more of the feelings and like actually like in pub in pub publicity and actually have more a positive like approach like not approach um I guess positive relationship to how they feel. I think it's very important. Oh yeah, you know I've, yes. I've blocked all negativity personally. Yes. Uh, really quick, I want to hear the rest of that thought, but I also don't want to drag on the same subject. So I'm going to go ahead and talk about the, the end of the story, and then get grab the input. Is that all right? Fine by me. So go right ahead. All right. So, um, you know, I'm I'm in there, and a few times, you know, that I've 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 had this these moments of, you know, real real feeling. I remember one time I was in class, and I remember just looking around. And just, you know, my whole state of mind changed. And I remember just, you know, being flooded with feelings and I didn't know how to handle it. And so, you know, <laughs> this is going to sound retarded. Um, to fix it, I didn't, I didn't know what to do. To fix it, I started looking for things to do. I started writing out ideas I had on a piece of paper. It didn't work. I started looking at videos on the Internet. It didn't work. I had a really hard time. And so... Um, Actually, at my school, they had pictures of volleyball like students or volleyball players' heads that they had cut out and put all over the school. I went and grabbed one off the off the floor and um, <laughs> and I <laughs> drew something on it and I put it on my face and it and I got back to work. Now, as dumb as that sounds, it, it like totally reverted me back. I felt like I had something that was tangible that could fix it. And I've done that before where, you know, I'd write on my hand or something like so and it looks retarded. It's not artistic at all. It's ugly. And the thing is, <laughs> I have it there and it's helped me, you know, um, really try to like sort of eliminate it. And I've, you know, sometimes I'll like, I'll think, oh, well, I'll just do this because last time it worked and I'll try it and it won't work. And so I don't know what to do to fix it. And so it's, for me, it is <laughs> It's something I really want to develop. It's something that I have put energy into. You know, I've I've tried to schedule time where I can try to work on developing the feelings, and and I, I want to be the best version of myself. So I work towards that, and it's it's really interesting what I find <laughs> under that. And at the same time, you know, moving throughout um, my life, I think there are lots of times where I think about my morals, my values, my guidelines, you know, things that I that I go by, um, believe, and then there's my plans and my vision and my future and what I want to do and be a, like what I want to become, and it's like that doesn't line up, and I'm aware of it, you know what I mean? But it's like it's like every once in a while I have a brief moment during the day where I'm like, that doesn't align. And then after that, I'm just like, well, you know, I've already put this work towards it, and then I just move forward. So, you know, I can see myself and my internal compass trying to tell me other things um, sometimes. So, that's my input. So, Andrew, what do you? What is your thoughts on all this? On more feeling? Yeah, just in general, like what we're explaining as ENTJ, um, kind of how we're interpreting our feelings. What's What's your perspective? Oh, you all are saying things that are very, very different from me, obviously. Well, let's hear that. Let's, uh, like, how, are they, how are they different? Well, I mean, I understand, and I have to grant that it is not in your functional stack. So it's not something that is going to come naturally to you, maybe ever, in your life. But that's okay. I mean, as long as you're not going out of your way to be mean, I'm okay with it. So how is it, how is it for you? Like your feelings, how do you handle your? What is it like for you? Oh, well, in my case, the more I developed introverted thinking, like when I uh, when I learned real reasoning skills, my emotionality actually went down a lot. So, so now, you know, life experience, learning reasoning. Uh, Oh, you know what the cognitive distortions are? Mm -hmm. So in psychology, for everyone else who's watching who doesn't, a cognitive distortion is a logical fallacy happening 
basically in real time in the mind. So people are applying logical fallacies to real situations and real people when it is a very inappropriate thing to do. And if you can stop that, I mean, yeah. that can lead to a lot of catharsis and just much more healthy behavior and thought right there. So could you give an example for the audience, like what would be a cognitive distortion? Well, all or nothing thinking. And I think when most people are at the point of putting in an honest attempt at suicide, they are way, way into all or nothing. And so when it's either all I'm not good enough or there's nothing left for me. So uh, one example I have personally is that, you know, I'll see people be like, oh, like my boss hates me or, oh, like, you know, <laughs> this person like has this problem against me and, you know, really you look at it and you're like, no, they don't. And it's because that person has subjective experience and they like pull from that and they think they, they start to have these negative ideas, you know, about like about the person or anything like that. And personally, I try to keep out of negativity and positivity. I mean, I do enter positivity more than I enter negativity, but I feel like both distort the world view. And so I try to see things as they are. That's my like my goal. But so that was just an example. I Is that, would that be like to, would that be extra resetting? Like seeing things as they are. Andrew, you're like trying to see things as they are. <laughs> from from a certain perspective, if you're trying to explain it, you could use it that way. But otherwise, no. It's really just uh, it's eliminating personal bias. Yeah. And I mean, I guess kind of like Stephen Covey said, like in his Ape Habit. If, you, if you're listening to someone and you can repeat back what they've said to their satisfaction, then you truly understand what they said. Or at least you have a true grasp of what they were trying to tell you. Yeah, so that, that basically is that the ability of what we call reflective listening, too, is really actively participating in the listening process as well, being able to uh, be involved in that. You know, I think that with our, our busy schedules, our busy lives, we don't spend a lot of time actually being concerned about other people and the way they feel about things. And um, with that being said, you know, like you said, in the eighth habit, that's, that's, that's critical. It's absolutely critical to have that focus and that that time span that we're we're moving we're in a society now that we're moving away from uh, as a society as a whole we're moving away from interpersonal relationships because great things have been introduced like technolo technological innovation um, a lot of uh, new rules and regulations and in, in school systems and new like I said technology has moved us so far away from actual social interaction that I, I fear for even our youth that they, they're not being involved in understanding these things as simple as listening, which I think is an absolutely critical social skill. Could you explain more about like the new uh, school advancements that are, have, that are taking place? Okay, I'm so... Interested in knowing that. Yeah, so it, an example is like school... For uh, a lot of schools, I don't, I can't say all schools because I obviously haven't been at every single school. But a lot of schools, they promote no talking, <laughs> no talking, shut up, eat your lunch, no talking during lunch period. That that was in my <laughs> school. That was definitely in my school when I was in middle school. Like there wasn't <laughs> any talking during lunch period. Yeah, I don't know, Andrew. Did you have a similar experience? Uh, no, I think they were more concerned with volume than anything. Yeah, there was, and then there was like even on, no on my talking school, during lunch. Yeah, and even on my school bus, it was like no talking on the bus. Like, I mean, everything was no talking. That's ridiculous. Yeah, and so there's a, there was the a more control. Yeah. Let, let me tell you about control. The more control you put on people, the, the more they're likely to actually uh, break the rules and rebel. I mean, it's such an obvious 
such a, it's so it's so like it's so obvious that people don't even realize that like the more like laws, the more the more things you implement on people, the more they're likely to actually do the opposite. It's just it's so it's so yeah. It's counterproductive. So I mean that's that's an example of some of the the things that are happening in the school system and and, and that was my extreme case. But again, you got advances like that that are designed to help certain that are designed to help certain people um, press forward you, you, and they're designed to help you know and educate and innovate students but at the same time you've got this this the backlash from it because the the consequences haven't been considered they need more ENTJ advisors <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't even know if it, that's the, the the solution, but I mean, for for sure, they need more advisors. Wait, what are you talking about right now? I just uh, zoned out. Sorry. Yeah, me too. Actually, <laughs> I zoned out because I received yeah. a text message. But I was I zoned no, out. No, I'm actually interested. Coffee, which is the worst? <laughs> what did you say? Uh, wait, I'm interested in what you what you want to say. Oh, I was just talking about the education system and and just in general, like why we've yeah. Um, go ahead. No, 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 I want you to go ahead. Okay. Listening. Um. So I'm not going to repeat it for the sole fact, but I'm just going to give you a summary. Essentially, you know, there's things, there's systems designed in the education system that are designed to propel students forward, but there's a backlash from it, or there's a counter effect. And the problem with that is that they they're not being they're not weighing the consequences of such programs that are uh, affecting students. Maybe even in the social skills. Maybe they they think group projects is the solution. The solution is unclear right now. But the thing is that these advances, mainly technological, are 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 distracting students away from actual social interaction. Because I can tell you right now, when I was a kid, and I'm sure Andrew might be able to relate, or maybe this is just where I'm from. But we were never inside. We were always outside. We were always on bikes. We were always doing something because we didn't have video games. We didn't have, like, we had huh. video games, but they were cheesy, and they got tiring. And when you died, the whole game restarted. Like, you didn't save. There was no saved games. Like, when you when your character died, it was like start from zero. I don't think I even... And uh, there was none of that. Think, there was I don't think I remember how it's like without technology. <laughs> Yeah, well, I do, and t it was, life was a lot different. It was it was incredibly different. Andrew, what what is your perspective on that? Oh yeah, I, I was born in 1980. Yeah, so grew up through the 80s and the 90s, and every so often, especially with my mom being an ESFJ and a former school teacher, she would kick us out at some point. She's like, "No, you've been playing too long. Go outside." And right. We'd go outside, and we were, you know, as like the reason foundation likes to call it, we were free range kids. So I mean we could go into the woods back behind our house. We could climb the trees and we didn't have any, you know, climbing equipment. And we could go fifty feet up sometimes. But somehow we all survived. We never really got hurt actually. I mean we could go or we could just tell our parents we were going over to someone's house and they didn't watch us every step of the way. And there was no cell phone, so when you wanted to go to their house, you had to go to their house. Yeah. Yeah, like, you know, ride your bike or whatever, get all the way to their house and go all the way there and check if they're home. If they're not, you ride all the way back. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and we rode bikes everywhere. That was the thing of the, thing of the past, apparently, because you don't see it that much anymore. At least I don't. And, um, you know, it, it's just everybody's becoming so Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook, you know, there's there's no more of that, and to me, that's what really created a lot of strong relationships. It's not the only answer. Like I said, there's a way to mold current society into re-engaging social skills, but uh, there there it needs to be it needs to be fixed, is what I'm saying. But in a different way, it doesn't need to restore back to the old. But there has to there has to be a a, a balance, and that's what I'm I'm really looking for. We're on a pretty heavy tangent for yeah, personality. Though. There needs to be balance. Yeah. Try. Uh, I <laughs> you caught think me. that um, there's still positive. There's still a lot of uh, positive. Um, there's still a lot of positivity in like the fact that 
we have so much more information like um, there's so much information that is taught to kid to different to kids and like to people and it's, it's definitely something that is helpful but if we could if we could like change the education so that we could actually have have people focus on their um, I guess emotion like emotional intelligence and like things that they need to actually move through life because uh, what I find is that like I literally have to look up things online to to <laughs> to actually know what is best for me like like actually to actually un understand things and like to actually know what moves to take moves to take and I feel like our, our our schools they don't actually like we keep we keep our, we teach things like some like teach subjects that without teach so many like um just just like <laughs> things that don't really help people move move towards the future like we're kind of like we're not really we're not we're not close to get a society we should be more like we should actually um we should actually be if we should actually like have people have people develop their skills so that they know who what they're good at and like and what they're not good at and like what they should do instead of we just we ignore what people are bad at we just we don't we ignore what what people are skilled at we just want everyone to to focus on one thing and it's just like just a very array of like nonsense it, it's kind of ridiculous and we need to find solutions for this right and I think that's, that's where a lot of great minds have to come together and start forming different uh, strategies that are actually would tackle this on a very individual basis. Now, you can't create a system that targets each individuality, but you can start being able to cater to different learning styles through kinesthetic learning, auditory learning, visual learning, you know, even scr uh, writing, scribing, whatever. Any type of, uh, any style of learning, we, they've, they've got to start interchanging a lot of these different methods. And kinesthetic generally stopped after kindergarten. <laughs> like you have PT, but that's about it. Like, you know, like. P. Yeah. Yeah. I meant PT. I think that um, I think that people should have like, like kids who are developing should have more of a choice. Like, notice how, how like some S users or like some other types of people they're more um, inclined to do physical activities, and that's what their job is about. They're gonna be. They're gonna be do. They're gonna play basketball. They're, I I love basketball by the way. I love to watch it. And some people would just want to go on the track of do sports. And like, why should we force people to do things that they don't even want? That they're not even gonna use later in life. It's just so ridiculous. And we should we should enforce people's um, free will and enforce people's individuality, enforce what they actually want to do and what they're good at. And that's how we have a successful society. I think it's kind of ridiculous how we just train people to be plugged into a machine, which is not helpful for society at all. Yeah. What do you think, Andrew? Um, again, I'm going to have to what was our exact... Subject. <laughs> We're talking. He, uh, Max is talking about. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't help it. <laughs> Trey, it's okay. It's okay, Andrew. <laughs> Trey, if you got this. Okay. All right. So, I think what we were talking about was, we were talking about like the system for uh, school and how we're like plug into machines and how that cuts out a lot of uh, different learning styles. And also, I think it was uh, covering as well the whole. Yeah, I was talking about how it's it's kind of like a metaphor. Like we get we plug we plug people in. We just plug each other in, and it's kind of <laughs> like we're all like different. Like like we're all like different. Like we're all like 
dumb like tools or something like. <laughs> it's it's the Matrix happening all over again. <laughs> Are you laughing at me or like because it's a funny concept? It's a funny concept. The way you're describing it, it's the metaphors. <laughs> Yeah, you're getting. I was, I was just seeing you get into yeah. it. Like your camera, your camera's mm -hmm. kind of like freezing because of your internet connection. So all I'm seeing is you like get into it, like flashes. I, it's just funny. <laughs> <laughs> I must look funny right now. Yeah, yeah, your library connection is not that good. So that's what makes it funny. But so yeah, Andrew, what what, what was your thoughts on that? Do you guys hear what I'm saying though? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, that's why I'm asking Andrew for his thoughts because I want to know his perspective because what makes this dynamic interesting is because three of us are intuitives. We see the world in a very intuitive way. Um, we, our perception, the way we see things is an intuitive way. So I keep putting the focus on Andrew because he's more about what is actually happening and not so much what's in between the lines. So I keep going back to him because I want to see how he sees it. So that's yeah, what's interesting to me. Yeah, well, honestly... I'm just going to try to go from, from the gaps that I saw in education, like K-12 and higher education. In K-12, definitely there's no reasoning, which we used to teach, and no matter how much people say they're going to build it into their lessons, they don't. You don't learn induction and deduction, and children as young as 12 can get started on it. I mean, back in the days, a thousand years ago, this is what constituted being educated at that age. And we have just completely lost it. We don't focus on classics. Like, people aren't taught classical languages anymore. They're not reading those stories that are really important in ancient history that form our thinking in a lot of cases. Is that we're just we're doing it very topically and superficially, which bothers me. And in higher ed, again, we're still failing to teach reasoning to the masses, and we're failing to teach moral reasoning. Like, until the 1960s, colleges and universities acted in loco parentis. Like, they were giving them more freedom, but they were still in a lot of ways, kind of acting like your parents were very concerned about it. And, you know, we've lost moral reasoning. They stopped it in the 60s with the whole, you know, sexual revolution and cultural revolutions that were happening at the time. And that we traded it for nothing. And now that's been a huge part of the dumbing down that's happened. And it's just really sad to yeah. see. <clears throat> Sorry, Max. I had to. I had to put you on mute. I think you had a baby crying in the yeah. background. Just the yeah. So, um, but yeah, I unmuted you now, so you're good. Um, I think. Okay. <laughs> and unmute. Okay, it's, it's it's lagging a little bit behind, but it, it'll it'll turn you off in a second here. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I think Andrew, you're spot on. There is a lot of a lot of very important logical concepts that are totally missing from our education system, which I'm pretty which I'm pretty passionate about. Like we need to we need to incorporate these things. But again, I think our our biggest issue is not even the education system itself. It's students not having an interest in the things that make us educated. Do you know what I mean? Yes, definitely. Definitely, definitely, definitely. All the kids around me talk about how everything they're learning is pointless. They don't see the point to anything. And I know because I use it in arguments. Like everything I learn, like someday I'll use that in an argument. I'll use that in some kind of uh, proving someone wrong or something of the sort. But it's like, and I and I value that, and I value the stuff I'm learning because I know that I, I don't really know what direction I'm headed, and for them to give me that general knowledge of will really help me in my direction, as well as just common knowledge is important. And it's like all the kids around me, they're all like, oh, this is pointless. Like I like I don't see why we're learning this. Like because they all say, here's what they all say. They all say that you yeah, can I'll use different. That in my they all say that you can use different things. Uh, as a substitute for um, for actual school, and I'll look that up. Go ahead and like I'll, I'll 
show you in a minute. I just have to find it. Go ahead and put like thoughts on that or whatever you're gonna say, Jed. So, um, Andrew, what is what is your uh, Max or Andrew? What is your add-on to that? And in, in conjunction with what Trey was saying, um, he I, like he said, there's definitely a lack of interest. In students. What do you propose to be a, a viable solution to get people, or specifically students, interested in these particular details again, and getting them interested in educational topics that actually are going to enhance them at a young age? I know what I want to say, but you can go first, Max. You want to riff? I think I think Max might be lagging, so if you want to go ahead, Andrew. Uh, all right. Well, <clears throat> I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to tie this into some issues we're we're constantly hearing in higher education. Is that is, we're always learning analysis, and then everyone says, everyone's always up in arms about the test, because on the test, the professor throws something at you that seems to come out of left field, and everyone says they're just, you know, they're trying to get you to think, and somehow you're not able to do it, but they're kind of two problems I see with that generally. So number one, if you haven't been reinforcing how to synthesize the material in other ways through the semester, the test when you're under the most pressure to perform is not the time that you're going to get the best synthesis. And the other thing is, I mean, if you were actually uh, making synthesis a point, the classes would be much more interactive already. I mean, it's the student's job to be prepared and show up. It's the professor's job to have content worth that effort of getting there. And honestly, you would be incredibly surprised at people's reactions when a professor or, in my case, I've had like a special speaker come in to the class but for managerial accounting. And he was just doing Socratic method. And I think everyone was like really surprised by it because they hadn't seen it from their other professors already. Because it's just that missing from the curriculum. Like, no one really gives a proper grilling anymore. Well, I can definitely agree with you. I think that's a, that's a big piece missing is that whole aspect of what you're talking about and, you know, these fundamental principles and being able to cover those things. And I really appreciate you going to the, in the guest speaking and, and, and double-checking and, and make, reinforcing the fact that we do need to prepare content as professor, professors because technology can also make professors very lazy. You know, your e-courses, everything, they've got the whole lesson plan lined up, here's what can happen, and it can make professors very lazy. So I, I think that there, there's also that double-edged blade, which is only not only hurting students, but hurting professors as well, because it's it's we do find the path of least resistance. And if it's easy to do it, and there's no reward because of the way that the federal, federal regulations and even state regulations for public education uh, they, they put limits on how much the professors can and can't do as well. We've got so many rules, so many limits, and then not to mention easy, the path of least resistance. It's like setting it up to fail, ultimately. Max, you want to go? Oh, no. <laughs> uh, I was just... I was just... You guys, I've, I have no knowledge. I don't really have a lot of knowledge about this topic. About no. you're still in high school. You're still experienced. Yeah, you continue. <laughs> Give yourself a couple of years. <laughs> yeah, but I'm sure Trey's got more input. Trey, man, what I was really gonna show, and I can't find it, but I've seen like you know memes online where people talk about how this class isn't important because we have this, and this class isn't important because we have this, and substituting certain things for like. Uh, and I can't really remember any specifics, but 
but you know, like Netflix or something, where they just say, oh, we don't need this because we have this. And so they just have a whole long list of things that can replace their class. And it's just like no one sees why what they're learning has any importance whatsoever. And they said like, and, and you know, for me, like I, you know, when I was in Italy, I was, I went to a dog school. And so for me, you know, I, uh, I personally had quite a bit of access to like really cool classes where I could learn things that I was interested in, but a lot of other people aren't. And so, um, like they don't have that access and a lot of schools don't have that access. And then, you know, they don't really look into it. Like I'm not really, they're not really looking into what classes they might be interested in. And so they don't really find much interest in school because it's just a routine that they don't agree with. And when, you know, more and more people can go home and post something on Instagram or on Facebook or whatever, and everyone sees it where they disagree with, you know, even going to school in the first place, uh, because we're all, like, united through the Internet, it's sort of like everyone sees this and really starts to question, do I agree with school? Do I see it as just a routine thing? And so extremely naive uh, who think that the school uh, isn't even important in the first place, and all they really use it for is to see their friends. And so, you know, that was my input on that. Not as, I don't really know a lot about the structure of school and stuff like that. I haven't done really a lot of research. I wasn't really interested. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's so funny how I use the school. <laughs> I think part of it is because you guys haven't been in the college yet. Because huh? the, the way that high school is still framing students, and I think a lot of it's because both of you are still in high school, the way that college, uh, high school frames university or college um, it frames it in the sense that it's going to be a different experience in high school, but really it's high school continued. And, and I mean that from a level of maturity. I mean that from the level of organization. Um, there, is a lot of more, there is a lot more opportunity yeah. in college in the sense of networks, groups, clubs, fraternities, yeah. sororities, whatever. Yeah. But ultimately, the education is just like high school continued part two, and the maturity level isn't different. Like, you've got 18-year-olds graduating yeah. high school three months really? later. They're, they're freshmen in college. What's the difference in three months? It's nothing. It, 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 there's, and then, not to mention that everything's still taken care of. Their bills are still paid. Their parents are still paying for them. So there's really no separation in the sense of, except the kid is now out of the house but still being babied by mom and dad. So you've got this situation to where there's no actual maturity or even in that three-month period where they're actually growing up. And that's where the challenge is. And I, I, I've seen good parents out there. They send their kids off to college. Not that there's anything wrong with parents paying for education. It's more of teaching your kids, hey, I'll pay for this, but I'm going to negotiate or barter this. Like, I will pay for this if you understand the consequences to this or this. Helping your children make and choose the best decision for themselves versus just laying it all out there for them. What do you think, Andrew? Yeah. Um, I you know, part of the reason that it's high school continued is, just like you said, it's directly tied to age, and a lot of college is growing up. Mm -hmm. Although, I mean, I wish I had gotten different information when I went to college, because my parents had both gone to college in the 1960s. They both had teaching degrees, and... By the time I was going to college, the version of college they had was basically my norm. So I didn't know that there were majors that took 90 hours to complete, and you had to start taking courses your spring semester freshman year, or you were going to be behind. I thought everything was you screw around for two years, and then you pick what you really want to do, and then you just have two years of it. And that was pretty much the only real perspective on it that I had. And I'm laughing so, because you're you're spot on. I mean, I've had so many times I've seen students go into college, and here's what goes through their mind. And, and actually, they say this too, like, "Dude, I'm taking my basics, bro." I'm like, "Well, what do you want to do? Just my basics?" I'm like, "Your basics. You're paying like ten thousand dollars a semester. I don't know if you really want to pay money if you don't know what you're gonna do. You know, it's not like you have to do it. College is an option. So you hear this basics, bro." mentality like oh man I gotta take my basics yeah. and I'm thinking 
you probably want to have an idea of really what you want to do. And it's okay to go to college later. It, it, it's not like you have to go at 18 or 19. You know, you can you can go to college later once you you have a, a decent sense of maturity. The good thing is I had a year between when I went to college versus when I actually went, graduated high school, and that year was hell. So by the time I actually went in college, went to college, I was already grown up even past my peers because between 17 and 19, that was a very painful struggle. <laughs> so when I went to college in my that year later, it was a it was a huge change for me because I didn't I didn't depend on anybody. I just paid my way through it myself, and uh, I didn't have support in going to school. So it was a big difference for me. And I don't I really wish that you know I don't want anybody to have to go through that to understand that and what I went through. But it more of the fact that I just hope that there's a there's a better way for students to be more ambitious to to want to personally develop. And this brings us this point back home, which is saying why MBTI is so such a powerful tool is because it puts us all in the position to want to make ourselves better sooner. It's a, it's a proactive way to enhance our development much faster than somebody who's reactive. Because a lot of people, what, what come about changes when a life circumstance hits somebody and goes, I can't do this anymore. MBTI is not this reactionary, I can't do this anymore. It's this, I want to get better. What about it? I should totally agree. Be, yeah. <sighs> What about it makes me want to get better? I want to get better. So it's not a reactive tool. It's a proactive tool. And I think that's why um, I've always taken an interest in it because I've always wanted to get better. Trey mentioned that. I want to get better every day. And I, I think that's why it's so exciting to really to dive into this particular subject. Yeah. Well, plus Honestly, there's like, good and bad news I'll about I'll I'll graduate I'll entry <laughs> now, mm -hmm. too. Yeah. I mean, most well, of the I'll time... You get an undergraduate degree, you're not going to be prepared to enter the workforce in a lot of fields anymore. But with the master's degree, at least in most cases, you can actually make up for what you did for your undergraduate program because in a lot of cases, they don't care. It's a test score and a GPA to go to a professional school. Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, Matthew, oh, I want to say something. Um, I wouldn't mind if MTI was taught in schools. It's so much more useful than the other things that they teach in schools. <laughs> like it's like it's such a it's a tool for self awareness. Like at least you have an idea of like what you're good at. Like it's like it could be like a beginning approach to knowing what you're good at. And like if we as if we could actually teach like schools even further um, teach I mean not teach individuals even further like on what they're actually good at and, like not what they think they should be doing or whatever then it would be such a more uh, pro, I guess proactive or in a sense like a more um, I guess intelligently like designed society because because if we just if we, if we just uh, fit we try to we try to put people in places where they don't belong. There are people who don't even like their careers. And what's the, it's not even useful for them to be in that career because they're not even good at it. And if we could, if it would be so much more productive for a society to teach people, to teach individuals. I mean, not to teach like to actually get individuals to know who they are and MBTI would be like an excellent tool for self awareness. And also um, you would you could include you could actually like you, you you could have a whole course of that basically makes it so that the individual actually knows exactly what they're good at, exactly what they're not good at. Like basically have an individual know who they are, which basically means what they're good at, what they like, what they don't like, what they what they're not good at, what they're what what tra traps they should have fallen for like what what uh what to improve on or what should be changed and things like things like that yeah that person you guys yeah. understand like how much <laughs> how useful it is to teach to teach to actually have people um so have self awareness of themselves and like Hey, Trey, go ahead. Get people in 
see where they that, know where they are. You know, personally, I, I do see Myers Briggs as great for personal development. And um, one thing that I continue to notice is that, yeah. you know, before get finding Myers Briggs, I really did see myself as very um, self aware. But now it's just helped me, you know, because now I know what I'm aiming for when I'm looking for development. And so, you know, I can kind of, you know, I can get into other things as well, but Myers-Briggs has really pointed me in a correct direction. And then, you know, the community as well, you know, understanding that there are people out there that can tend to your inferior and tertiary function, you want to find those people and surround yourselves with them so that you can understand better, you know, how they work. And, you know, it is stressful and it can be annoying. But you know, when you when you can find the the people that are really gonna help you work at it, that's that's really important. And so yeah, I do see Myers Briggs as a as um, something that's really big for personal development and um, self awareness, and really just directing you in like in how to be the best version of yourself. Like I've said, you know, multiple times. But one thing is that you know. One question I've had in the back of my mind is, do I really want to make my feelings um, more prevalent? Do I really want to work on them? Do I want to develop them? And so, you know, because it makes things harder sometimes. And so, yeah, and I'm so used to working in, in um, the, the state that I've been working in for so long. And so, you know, I question it, but I know, I know that it's better. And I hey, know Trey, that can you hold that thought real quick? Yeah. Max, you're you're pacing around and you might be distracting some viewers. Yeah. And it's it's actually distracting me. So if you can find us, oh, that, that would help tremendously. All right, Trey, go ahead. All right. Yeah, but no, what I was saying is that you know it really. I recognize that you know if you can understand more aspects of people because if we all have our dominant and secondary function as well as our tertiary and inferior but we work more on our dominant secondary for the first part of our life, then there's a lot of people who just don't recognize, aren't able to um, relate to anyone specifically. Like, you know, like with certain groups of people, they just can't relate to them at all. And so, you know, I think that for that reason, it's really important to, you know, work on your inferior and tertiary function and, and you know, really develop those, not necessarily because you've, you know, you want your feelings or anything, but because you can understand others on a deeper level, and you know, it helps with That's communication and life in general. And so, you know, yes, Myers Briggs points me in a good direction. I've questioned the direction. Do I want this? Is this something that I want? And is this something that's legitimately going to help me, or is this going to stress me out later? And, you know, it may stress me out. I'm not really sure yet. I haven't gotten there. But if I do, you know, I think that I've determined that it's going to be worth it, you know, working towards, you know, unraveling yourself and understanding um, every part of yourself without having to have those years of wisdom and experience necessarily um, to get you there. I would I would definitely say that's a... That's, uh... I feel the same way. Targeting those functions also, it's not even just, you know, hey, self-development, but it also teaches you to communicate with other people. It teaches you, like, there's certain aspects of your character that you know won't work with certain types. Like, if I were to come off as a TE person to someone who doesn't understand thinking function in general, or at least that's not their natural preference, they may see me as harsh, and I may not be able to do whatever... I need to do to get things taken care of. So that's a, that's a big aspect of communication. It's leadership development, stress management, conflict resolution. It's all in there. And, and Myers-Briggs really points a direction of those things. Was that you, Trey? Yeah, that was me. <laughs> I need to plug in my device and the wall you know is too far away. Or, guys, well, Matt, uh, here's what you can do. I guess uh, Andrew, yeah, what were you saying? Um, yeah, I took the MBTI multiple times as an undergrad. And honestly, there were two main problems. Number one, it wasn't being given to me at a time that was really going to help because I was doing it as, say, a junior or in upper division courses generally. 
And number two thing is you only really hear about the behavioral side. You get your little four-letter code and kind of go from there. You don't get the functional stack. You need to get to step two to get the really important information out of it. Uh -huh. But, you know, that would make a really awesome summer course. I would agree, absolutely. And I think that anybody who has any desire to grow or learn or become better at themselves and overcome their fears, because we all have fears at some deep level. There's fear of public speaking, fear of spiders, fear of anything. To overcome those levels and to overcome fears, even uh, fears that you don't know are related to, so say, personality, especially like public speaking, just understanding why is a huge aspect to developing and growing and learning how to handle those things and say, okay, why is it this way? Of course, MBTI isn't the answer all or say all, but it certainly is a, a one tool to help people move forward in life. And I, I, I definitely agree with Trey on targeting those functions and knowing where to target specifically to grow. And like, you know, for you, uh, Andrew, it's FE and then your, your last function, which is NI. And for uh, Trey and I, it's, it's going to be that SE and that FI. And so those are, those are areas that we personally seek out, say, okay, I've been on TE mode, I've been focusing on work for so long, it's time to go live life a little bit and go experience a little more sensory information. Go get involved in conversation. Um, and that's that SE, I'm trying to target that SE. Go get involved in uh, living life and having good conversation and, and not always anticipating outcomes. But just live in the moment for one minute for three minutes, for ten minutes, whatever it may be, and realizing that about your cognitive behavioral stack, that really helps. And, you know, you could just, like, walk the same path just multiple times so you know it really, really well, and just wait until you find yourself noticing something different. Exactly. Just keep doing it until you start noticing different things, different levels of detail. One, one thing I, I definitely want to comment, just so that, you know, viewers know this, if, if they don't know, you know, is that if you want to expand on your cognitive functions that are inferior tertiary functions, you're going to need to separate yourself or... Okay, so for example, you know, if you're working on your inferior function, for me specifically, I have an introverted function, uh, introverted feeling. So, you know, I'm going to separate myself, disconnect, try to access this function, try to, you know, put myself in a mood. And so that's one thing that I would do. But then if it's extroverted functions, you're going to have to work towards um, doing it in public. And that, that can be an issue because if the world sees you trying to flex these functions depending on what the functions are you're gonna have a really hard time doing it so you know for you know for some people they may have a function that's extroverted that you know will cause them to make a lot of mistakes in one day and this could mess up a lot and so you have to be careful but I really just wanted to point out the fact that to work on those functions you have to work on them individually and you have to work on um, in setting up your environment, and you also have to be careful when it's an extroverted function, you know, because it's so new and so fresh that you may have a hard time developing it, and you may get yourself in some trouble. So I just wanted to say that. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good um, a good perspective to have. What do you think, Andrew? I like that, and I say uh, find your triggers if you have them. I mean, things that just make you mad in an instant. If you can find that, like, I'd say that's probably more than half the battle right there. And just dealing with your your tertiary or the grip of the inferior. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, that's been no end of help for me. What yeah. what what Eric? What how have you targeted your your bottom two functions? Have you targeted those or spent much time targeting those or what's your experience like? I'm still trying to get into good information on how to deal with them in the first place. Mm -hmm. Honestly, is I happen to have run across well just in my own experience, it's like being in the car 
thinking about something and getting worked up and really mad, like I'm yelling at the windshield, and it's like, wait, that's all really negative stuff, and it's all like possibilities. It's like I'm in the grip. And just that one uh, realization, it's like, I'm in the grip. I know what it feels like. Th this is what's happening. And suddenly, just right there from that, it's like, wow, now I can tell when I'm going into the grip. <laughs> I mean, the way you said that, that was right so there, funny. <laughs> <what>? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't trying to I'm going to be watching that later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was good. Yeah, he was getting passionate. <laughs> but he's right. He's, actors, right? Man. He's a, he's 100% right though. That is that is exactly what it is. Myers-Briggs officially does call it the grip too, in the grip. And yeah. that's when your inferior function erupts into your dominant function and it becomes this Say that? Is it grip? Grip. It, grip. G R I P. Grip. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Like like grip. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's called in the grip, and it's a it's an official Myers Briggs thing. They call it being in the grip when that inferior function erupts into your personality, and it's it's this childlike function. So it misbehaves when it does that too. It's not like the function's actually um, performing the way it should be. It's misbehaving. It's doing what it's not supposed to be. And so for me, it would be FI, and for Trey, it would be FI as well, and for Max, it would be SI. Yeah, <laughs> I I don't really use SI. Well, I, I SI for me it comes uh, it, it just comes like it's so unconscious. It just comes like um, I don't even know when it, when it comes. Just when I when it does when I do like feel feel it in my body or like in me. Like I just try to resist it because it's like. I don't usually. I'm not really accustomed to that type of feeling. It's just I just don't like that, and yeah. And I guess I have to. I had to learn to like to not resist it. To just like to let it be there. Usually, I'm just trying to. I'm trying to explain. Um, SI is, is usually comes to as a feeling. That's. Okay, I think I understand what you're saying. Did you? Does anybody understand what he was yeah, saying? Yeah, it's like it's not really. It's, I, I, it's like I can't really describe what it is. I mean, I guess an an ESJ would easily describe. What it is. I think we lost him. Darn. I think SI just freaking library Wi-Fi. <laughs> I think SI just it is not utilized is in situations like different. Um, in different, when I when I'm trying, for example, when I'm trying to do something, I don't you you like my SI to actually do something. I actually like to use my TI to actually understand something, and then like. I can't use TI and understand what what the internet cuts off. That's what I do. Uh, <laughs> now we're gonna Just have to tell see me how it's right. applicable to something. Well, that long goes situation. <laughs> yeah. What? Stop laughing. Okay, it for the last two minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's like cutting off your your connection is terrible, and so we're getting little bits and pieces of it, and it's just it winds up being quite amusing. I wish I got your thoughts. Really? Though, but yeah, you're talking about SI and how. Oh my god. Yes. You like freeze, and then we're all just sitting there like blinking. <laughs> yeah, we are. blinking, trying to figure out like what piece did you catch? Because I caught this part. <laughs> did you freeze again, or is this real? <laughs> I, saw, I saw his eyes moving. Oh, you did? Is he yeah. moving? Is he yeah, he's moving. <laughs> okay. Sure. Picture. Yeah, there he is. I mean, he's okay. up. He's moving. Kind of like when you're a kid and you poke a dead squirrel. Is it dead? <laughs> you know, you poke it with a stick. <laughs> <laughs> you need a long stick, man. A really no, long. I have to do two TPs. A really long stick. <laughs> like when they go to Washington or whatever. 
Is that where you're at, Max? Washington? Yeah. Washington, Washington needs State, better Wi-Fi. Seattle, the best place on earth. You guys should come here and come to uh, kind of like walk with me or, some, or do something. Yeah, this is getting weird. Uh, yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't quite pick up what you're saying, but I heard something about Master Yoda and Star Wars. That's about it. No, I, I didn't. That's not what I said. Okay. <laughs> that's not what I said. Okay. Um. Yeah. Your your connection is cutting out pretty bad. You're gonna have to go back to the other spot. Yeah, you're gonna have to pace around the library a little bit more. Yeah, go find where the signal is stronger again. Should yeah. I really? Yeah. Yep. So in the meantime, Max, I'm gonna shut your camera off. Okay. Okay. So we can't see Max right now because I shut his camera off because I think that would distract people. All right. So. Um. Anyway, where were we? I might have to shut his auditory off too because it's switching the. <laughs> Okay. Okay, I think we're good. Yeah. Yeah. Trey, you clear? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> that was an experience. All right. All right. So now that we got that, well, I don't know where he is now because I can't hear him or see him. So <laughs> we probably need to. We probably need to figure out where he is. <laughs> yeah. Um, but where were we? We're talking about inferior function. Is that right? Yeah, we're talking about inferior functions. We're talking about the way that uh, they develop and stuff. Okay, and so also like targeting them and stuff like that. So, do, do you, Trey, do you have a period in your life where you were particularly in the grip? Oh yeah, dude, man. Most of my life, like, um, I don't really like getting in detail on what this is on the internet for a few reasons, but I'll just go ahead and give a, a basic overview. Sure. There was most of my life, my feelings were being um, exposed. And, you know, ENFPs will do this thing where, and I'm not, there's no offense to them at all, but they'll do this thing where they go in depth on their extroverted intuition. And and they'll just they'll like notice something and they'll get they'll get they'll be like hmm what was that and they'll just go deeper and deeper and deeper on it and they'll miss the whole point of said conversation sometimes all right and so I had an experience where you know I had to be I was with one um, I'll go ahead and say it uh, it was my mom she she would do this and you know no offense to my mom, I didn't really understand much about MBTI and what she was doing at all. And so, you know, this whole, uh, it kept it kept getting at me and it kept, you know, exposing my feelings. And, you know, as I developed and, you know, became, like once I grew up, sort of, and, you know, took on a different mindset, you know, that kind of started going away. And, and it would just piece by piece, but I would still have my times when, you know, my emotions were flooded out, you know, all over the place. And it was frustrating. And, you know, one event in my life changed that. And, um, you know, I think that was one event that, you know, was really difficult for me as a person, but really did help my development as a person as well. And so, you know... It, it was difficult, and that decision really was hard in the moment. It was, like, the hardest decision I've ever made, but that really did help me and my my growth. So let's just go with that. <laughs> That's fine. Um, like I said, you don't have to share details. Just, just basically, if you had an experience, just being in the grip and kind of what it was like. So it sounds like it. Yeah. You know, really, my feelings were... Um, a big part of everything and you know like I said uh, at first you know I wasn't really that social and so at that time I was a very emotional person and that may have been because earlier on I had you know been using those out of preference functions because a few factors keeping my um, extroverted thinking from really dominating 
Um, and so maybe, you know, that introversion that I often experience, and I've noticed too, like I remember watching a video about INTPs, I think his username's Tomacity or Tomacity or something like that, and he started asking questions in his videos that I remember asking myself when I was a lot younger. And it was really interesting because he was INTP and I'm ENTJ, and, you know, that's also the mirrored function stack, you know. So it was a really interesting thing to see because I remember doing that as a, when I was younger, I would really, you know, ask these same questions. I would ask questions that, you know, I really did want the answer to and no one would be able to give me those. And so it, it was interesting. And and it really, it really made me think about the way that, you know, mirrored functions may work as well as the way that my conditions made me handle my functions and you know, suppression of some fun functions as well. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks for uh, thanks for sharing that particular aspect of that. Uh, Andrew, you have anything to add? Isn't is that noise bothering you? Like the the noise of my surroundings. Uh, it's not yeah, bad now. but it's not not that bad right now. Okay. So, Andrew, you need to have, have anything to add, add about being in the grip or your inferior functions or anything like that? No, I just I get really snappy at people when it happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I can feel myself kind of, well, I was, I was in the Marine, and, of course, I went to boot camp. I had six drill instructors, and... We finally realized at some point they're just they're turning on all the aggression and anger and screaming. And a lot of times they can just turn around when no one sees them and turn it off. And I had kept that with me for a really long time. And so there were times when I could feel that the turning on kind of without my conscious consent. And that's when, finally, after a really long time, I could tell that it was, like, the grip triggering it. Mm -hmm. And if you're in the grip for a long time, like what Naomi Quank wrote and was that really me, then eventually you're going to lose conscious control of it. And you're probably going to snap at people in whatever, in whatever way uh, befits your inferior function. But realizing when, like when I'm by myself and in the car and I want to scream at someone or give them the finger for doing something stupid, like I realized that that was feeling like the same kind of trigger. And like, like I said earlier, which elicited some laughs, just catching yourself in that moment is really big this is so weird. for dealing with uh, just your, whether it's your tertiary or your inferior. Oh. Just catch yourself in that moment. So I personally uh, don't think that my inferior functions have been triggered by things that made me angry. Now, you know, I, I kind of start to wonder if this has anything to do with Enneagram as well, because maybe um, what sector you're in in Enneagram, you know, shame, uh, anger, and uh, fear, maybe those are the things that trigger your inferior functions. It's likely, but I, I think, Trey, you and I have the same circumstance when it comes to this, too. One thing is I've noticed I have a few, and this is just my subjective experience, but I have a few ESTP friends that I know of, and uh, they all talk about this angry, this anger thing. Okay. And, and, um, and Andrew's also resorted back to flipping people off and, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, not that he does that all the time, but he's, he's mentioned that, like, you know, getting angry at traffic. I don't get angry at traffic. I mean, I think someone's stupid, but I don't get angry. I'm just like, yeah, someone, that, that guy's an idiot. You know, like, and, okay, get out of the way. You're an idiot. You're a moron. Get out of the way. That's how I think. Even if someone flips me off, I just smile and wave. It doesn't bother me at all. Like, I'm just like, yeah, thumbs up. Okay. You know, like, 
I don't. But at the same time, my ESTP friends are like, pull over, pull over. Like they're like getting wanting to get into that SE you know, <laughs> mode of like just just taking it to the next level. And that's pretty much every person who I know has leads with this extroverted sensing. Is it's just they're they're taking advantage of an opportunity at the moment, but that inferior NI is like, what are the consequences of this? See, I don't get mad because I, I my NI is always active in this sense, and it's overruling any kind of SE function. And what I'm realizing is this person may have a gun, this person may hurt me, this person may damage something, may cost me, may run into my car, may damage my car, may stalk me, may do this, and this is being calculated. Well, it's the same way. Yeah, and so I'm not going to think things. about the possible risks. Yeah, and there, I weigh out pros and cons and risk, you know. And uh, but it's not that one way is better than another way. It's just looking at these functions and looking how the dynamics work. Point being is that he leads with this extroverted sensing, and it's not an angry function naturally, but maybe it is that that function that doesn't know how to handle that particular thing, and it passes it off to the inferior function of being in the grip. Whereas me, for an example, when I feel super stressed out or everything's bad. I do feel an eruption, but it's not anger. It's it's my emotions coming to the service and not being able to sort out the feelings that I feel and understanding them, and then not being able to control how I feel about things. So I don't know if that's similar for you, Trey, but it's like I don't have that full control over my emotions when it does erupt into my personality. Yeah, you know, I feel I feel the feelings, okay, but I don't really think that. Um, it happens, like like I said, when it happens when I'm like like the whole day, I really just kind of go inwards, and you don't really see me talking as much. There's a few, you know, moments in the day where I'll like joke around, but like the overall um, theme of the day is that it's not my normal routine. Yeah. And it's just like, you know, the whole day where you would see me doing something, activating conversation, Whatever it is, you know, like, I'm just not doing that. I'm just sort of, um, you know, sitting down, just kind of, like, not even really looking around. I think a lot of times I'll zone out when I'm using my feelings. I, And that's probably, like, the only way to get me to zone out, like, incredibly. And that, I, think I, that, I can relate to that. Absolutely can relate to that. Because, because when I'm using my intuition, I don't necessarily zone out. Like sometimes I will, like, but I think a lot of times my intuition kicks in in really important times when I'm actually extroverting. But if there's a moment in there where, you know, um, it, I just start looking at something and, and like everything blocks out for just a second and then I like kick back in. And, I, and that was my introverted intuition. I made a conclusion or something of the sort. And I think that for my um, feeling, it's much more, um, it really does block me out a lot more than the introvert intuition might, mm -hmm. um, where I just, I totally block out and I'm like, like everything is different. And so, you know, for me, it's, it's really interesting. My feelings when I'm, intro when I'm using my inferior function are not necessarily, um, they're not like pronounced, I guess. I don't like I said, you know, it's really complicated, but that's not necessarily what I'm getting at. I'm getting at the fact that I don't really know what I'm feeling at all. And so it's not necessarily anger. It's like a question. It's like what am I feeling? And I don't feel angry. I don't feel like shame, but that's probably the closest one because I'm not afraid of anything for sure. And so shame would probably be the closest thing, but I just don't I don't want to call it that because it doesn't feel like anything, honestly. It feels like yeah, I, I just get really, really introverted when I feel like I'm in the grip. Just I don't want to talk. I don't want to do anything. I just wanna think. It's really weird. Yeah. yeah. Well and having to stay in certain situations will put you there. Right. Sometimes like if you have to keep coming back to a bad like a bad work situation that can turn a good day into a bad day. Just right there, just by its own nature. Right. Yep. One thing I, I think I, I can say is that, oh, dude, I lost it. Um, <laughs> just lost it, man. Um, oh, that sucks. <laughs> <hold on. laughs> All right, well. 
Um, <laughs> that sucks, Trey. Yeah, hold but, on, I'll get it back. No, you can go ahead. Go on, I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. Okay, so uh, we're gonna we're gonna wait for Trey to, to come up with his his thought. Let's just hope his introverted intuition kicks in in the next like five seconds. But other than that, um, I'm gonna probably wrap up this call because it's been running almost two hours now. So I want to wrap up this. And uh, if you guys have any last comments or things to say, I think Max just muted himself, so I guess he's opting out um, of saying any last comments here. But uh, Andrew, what would you like to? Say any any last comments? Just say I'm gonna mute my microphone because I have people in the background. What? That wasn't me. No, I was asking you. Do you have any last comments, Andrew? Like uh, things that you want to end uh, say before I end the call? Well, yeah, I thought like Max was saying something, but I'd say uh, let's do it again and keep me more of your friends. Oh yeah, absolutely. I, I look forward to having ex exchanging the information and and getting more insights. And uh, probably on the next one, we're gonna have a little more of a format of things that we need points we need to. Cover. I just want to say. I just want to say how uh, how it was intriguing to see uh, an in, in, you like your perspective as a T user to actually to see your to just see T users. Stands like perspective. I mean, it's just, it just. Did anybody get any of that? Yeah, he said that he was interested in seeing us T users. I think communicate with each other, or maybe just communicate in general. Okay, I didn't get it. It's cut out completely on me. So. Oh, it's Whoa, that was. Express their feelings. That What? <laughs> oh yeah, you're you're. I didn't hear any of it. So um, yeah, but I think Trey heard you. No, I really didn't. They cut out again. It was like ring, ring, ring. It yeah, was like a hangouts thing. R two D two noise or something. Yeah. So um, but yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna definitely uh, continue these calls in the future. And like I said, have a layout for the way that I think things should be organized, and then we'll go into like different topics about MBTI. I do like free flow conversations like this because you never know what direction it's gonna go. It could be really yeah. deep or it could be really stupid, and and either way, it's fun. And that's why I just wanted to like. That's why the topic of this video is conversation about whatever, whatever came to mind. And you've got different personalities here with different viewpoints, different perspectives. And I, I hopefully I involved everybody enough in this conversation to. Uh, I just got another message. Somebody said we should label each person with their type. Um, okay, so I am an ENTJ. Trey is an ENTJ, and Trey's the one with the dark screen. He, he right looks like, here. A, like a right like here. a like a Sith Lord. And then um, Andrew over there, he's the one uh, in the black shirt. He's an ESTP, and the one that's like disappearing from reality. That's Max. Um, he's frozen in time <laughs> right now, uh, but he's an ENTP. So that those are their types. I just got that comment. So hopefully, I wish I could label on here. I don't think I can, um, but. Uh, that is you can the, do it afterwards. You can annotate the uh, screen. I probably could. Yeah, that's that's a good idea. You know me though about editing videos. Like I hate it, so I don't generally do the that stuff. But um, as far Write as that goes, do what? Describe us all in the description. Yeah, I probably will just throw it in the description. That that'll make it a lot easier. But yeah, definitely we'll we'll get I'll get different types on here. Hopefully we get a feeling preference because that's I think really what was missing here was getting that perspective. We have too many thinkers. And so yeah, our audience might have been a little bored from the logic that we were tossing around, especially about the school system, the the facts about MBTI, and not so much how it impacts others. So that'd be something I'd like to add in the conversation in a few, uh, the future. Somebody who has a feeling preference to understand the impact of MBTI, how it affects people, and then their perspective um, as well. So getting a little more diversity, or someone who prefers introversion on here. As you can tell, we I'd like to talk. Trey likes to talk. Um, so we got this this extroversion thing going on and we had all three or four extroversion preference people so sometimes getting those introverted preferences on here can really make a, a nice dynamic change. Trey, any, any last comments? Man, I tried to uh, bring that up but I just couldn't remember it so no. But Next I really video. did. 
I really did enjoy this whole call. I really did. Uh, you know, just constantly talking about, you know, Myers Briggs and like personal development stuff like that. It really does um, get your mind going in the right direction. And so I really do appreciate putting time into this. Yeah, and I appreciate Andrew for wanting to join us on this. And uh, so it's it's always a blast being able to share ideas. And you know, we're all here trying to grow and learn and get new experiences and, and hearing those different perspectives always expands my mindset and I hope it does for our viewers too and the people that watch this video or even skim through it they pick something up that can help them move forward and that's my objective is putting this stuff up here in the first place is just there's sometimes it takes that one little tidbit of piece of information to really help someone in a particular struggle in their life and I hope that these long conversations can have that one little golden nugget for that one person out there and then my job has been complete so, all right, uh, thank you guys for viewing as well, and uh, I'll touch base with you all, and then we'll set up another call sometime, and we'll try to get some other types involved in this procedure as well. So, Trey, thank you again. Andrew, thanks again. Trey's channel is Trey4L. If you want to uh, subscribe to his channel, that, that's always a, an opportunity for, to explore more of the ENTJ mindset. He has a lot of great topics on there, a lot of theoretical topics, and a lot of personal experience. And so uh, subscribe to his channel. It's trey 4 l Subscribe. You can yes. add me on Instagram and Snapchat as well at Trey 4 l And if you really want to explore the depth of the feeling side of an ENTJ, at least one of them, he is apparently his Instagram has a lot of his writing on there. So uh, follow him on Instagram. Trey, what's your Instagram? Uh, Trey 4 l as well. Okay, so it's um, Trey 4 l Also, if you're interested, um, if you want to know more about feelings, I'm more open to talk about them personally. So if you were to personally message me or something. I would be more willing to talk about that, like more openly and in depth. So. Oh, thank you for that, Trey. And yeah, it's Trey the number four and L as in lion. So Trey number four L, not F O R. So, all right, guys, thank you so much for joining, and we'll talk to you soon.